Well, we return this morning to the uh, 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians. As we continue to study spiritual things, as Paul calls it, we're studying the matter of spiritual gifts, and specifically, at this point, in this large portion of Scripture, which involves chapters 12, 13, and 14, Paul has zeroed in on the gift of tongues, or languages. This immature church has had many issues where they have demonstrated their immaturity. Or remind us of a few of those. They've had factions over teachers. They've tolerated immorality. They've sued each other. They've had issues with liberty versus conscience. They've had misunderstanding concerning men's and women's roles. And they've had sin concerning the Lord's table. Now other than that, uh, other than the matters of factions in the church, Paul has used the most amount of ink around the issue of spiritual gifts. I mean, he spent a long time addressing the matter of their factions and their divisions among themselves. But Paul has spent a lot of time on this matter of spiritual gifts. And of the spiritual gifts, the gift of tongues has been his biggest target of concern. It was this issue of tongues that represented one of the biggest problems for the Corinthian church as it greatly contributed to one of the most disruptive and dangerous errors of a philosophy of ministry. And even today, there has been an ongoing struggle and question regarding what the purpose of the church is. What are we here for? Why are we gathering? Or said another way, what is our focus and purpose of gathering together on the Lord's Day? And you can often tell pretty quickly what the philosophy of ministry at a given church in terms of what their primary focus or belief is in terms of their purpose goals. It doesn't take very long to figure that out normally. Let's talk a little bit about what those options are. Some people view the church, the purpose of the church, or specifically the purpose of the Sunday gathering, as primarily evangelistic. Now that can lead to various emphases, such as the sermon's focus is especially targeted at the lost. The goal of the service, then, is to get people saved. This is often evidenced by the content of the sermon, but also commonly expressed in altar calls. Getting people to make a decision for Jesus. Getting people to come forward. This is a, a view of the purpose of the gathering of the saints to be primarily evangelistic. Another philosophy of ministry for churches is focused on the worship experience. And notice that I didn't say worship. But it is the aim is the experience of worship. And those are not the same thing. Though they may be conflated as being the same thing, this is where the attention is given to how we feel about God and how we feel about ourselves. This is your charismatic and charismatic light worship service where a heavy emphasis is placed on music that is targeted at emotion, performance is exalted, and messages high on positivity and low on sin, conviction, and repentance. Because you want to feel good about your experience of God. And this philosophy is fairly broad among evangelicalism today. As I said, you can have very heavy charismatic churches where you have the use of fake tongues and other counterfeit gifts. And you can have more conservative churches who really want a meaningful worship experience, and so they craft their services around the music and the style, though preaching may be at a higher level. But remember that I warned us a couple weeks ago of the dangers of pursuing a religious experience. And we'll get into that more again today. Another philosophy of ministry of the Lord's Day, of our gathering together, is focused on growth. And I'll highlight this as the attractional model. And this is kind of a blend of evangelistic 
philosophy and the worship experience philosophy. It kind of brings those two ideas together. The purpose of church is then seen to grow in terms of numbers or size. Though they may not admit that openly, but they do so by attracting the unchurched or the person who is seeking God, so-called, by appealing to their felt needs. A lot of this used to be couched in terms of seeker-sensitive, but much of that language has been absorbed into other terminology today. Nobody really talks about seeker-sensitive, but the idea is largely the same. There is a heavy emphasis on giving people what they want. Give the people what they want. What do people want? Well, predominantly, the people want ease. They want convenience. The people want child care. The people want positivity. They want atmosphere. They want authenticity. They want to be affirmed. People want to be welcomed. People want to be comfortable. They want a music style that is familiar and it is current. It's up to date. And people have a negative view of tradition and religion, so it is believed. It is perceived that the unchurched have often had a bad experience with traditional religion in terms of judgmentalism and traditionalism. So the emphasis is on distancing themselves from tradition, distancing themselves from things that are often connected with religion, and focusing instead on relationships and experience. And the argument is offered that we can't minister to them if they aren't here, right? And so it's all about pragmatism, which is strong in churches with this kind of philosophy. We have to get people to come. We have to find out what their desires are so that we can help them to find God. They want to be attractive to the lost. They want to be attractive to the unchurched. It's the e-harmony version of church ministry. Where you, where you seek to be as compatible and attractive to as many people as possible. So what do we see as a proper biblical philosophy of ministry for when the saints gather? The Apostle Paul has laid out for us a pretty strong argument. That the ministry purpose of the gathering on the Lord's Day is for worship of God that edifies the saints. Worship of God that edifies the saints. And our view of God will inform our worship. Whether or not we have a high view of who God is. A high view of what the Scripture describes God to be like. Or whether we are man-centered, self-focused, experience-oriented, or whether the holiness of God, the glories of the Gospel, and proper worship are in our minds. And as the saints gather, Paul has been laying out a strong case for why every element of our corporate worship is to be purposeful in building up the body in edification through intelligent, inte intelligible understanding of God and of His truth. And so our aim is not that you feel good. Now, you will likely, hopefully, as one who is saved and loves the Lord Jesus Christ and loves His Word and His truth, there will be times where you feel good. But that is not our purpose and our aim. Often the aim needs to be, and the Holy Spirit will apply His truth and His conviction upon us differently, but often it will be that you don't feel good. There are times when we should not feel good about ourselves. Our aim is that God is highly exalted, that the gospel is central, and that you are built up in the truth. And hope, hopefully, as you align yourself with God's will, your heart and your emotions and your affections are stirred to wonder, love, and praise. But what is our aim? What is our purpose? That is important for us to understand. 
Today we're going to see how Paul instructs us regarding the purpose of tongues and how a philosophy of ministry affects the order of things when we gather together. So let's read this whole section and we'll get as far as we can today. I want to read 1 Corinthians 14. I want to read the whole section, verses 20 to 33. 1 Corinthians 14, beginning in verse 20. Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. In the law it is written, by men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me, says the Lord. So then tongues are for a sign, not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. A prophecy is for a, a sign, not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all, he is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring, God is certainly among you. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If anyone speaks in a tongue, it should be by two, or at the most three, and each in turn, and one must interpret. But if there is no interpreter, he must keep silent in the church, and let him speak to himself and to God. Let two or three prophets speak, and let the others pass judgment. And if a revelation is made to another who is seated, the first one must keep silent. For you can all, for you can all prophesy, prophesy one by one, so that all may learn and all may be exhorted, and the spirits of prophets are subject to prophets. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace as in all the churches of the saints. We begin in verse 20. And this is an interesting statement to open this paragraph. He says, Brethren, do not be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants. But in your thinking be mature. And though he is still in line with the subject of tongues, of prophecy, and what goes on at the church, he's going to lay the wood to the Corinthian way but he sensitively addresses them first as brethren. We've noted this several times throughout the book, and it is important to note that even when expressing tough love, we are reminded that we are family. Sometimes tough love is what we need, isn't it? Sometimes we just need to be told the truth. Sometimes we need to be corrected. But Paul reminds us we're still family. And that what he means by speaking to them in a corrective way is that he loves them. And we are reminded that our relationship is one that desires each other's good and not harm. That is the purpose of these spiritual gifts, all of them, is that we might do good to the entire body. That we might all be, benefit, be benefited by each other. We don't mean harm. Our motives should be one of seeking each other's good. But Paul continues to speak to his family, instructing them to not be children in your thinking. Now, we're going to talk a bit more about children tonight and some of the different categories of children in terms of parenting and how children relate to the qualification of elders in the book of Titus. But Paul is concerned here with childlike reasoning and thinking. And we noted here that we know here that Paul is speaking to adults. But the concern is over adults who are immature like children. But I'm reminded of a couple other places in this letter where Paul has referred to childlike thinking. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, a long time ago when we were there, 1 Corinthians 3 verses 1 and 2, he says, And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you are not able. The Corinthian church, in Paul's mind, were considered to be babes in Christ. 
They were not mature men. They thought of themselves very highly, though. Do you remember how they thought very highly of their own maturity, their own wisdom? But they were not mature men, described here as spiritual men. But instead, Paul was originally with them. He gave them what they could handle, which he described as milk instead of solid food. What was frustrating to Paul is that after the passage of approximately five years since he had been with them, five years since now he has written this letter, they were still not able to receive the solid food of mature people. There is a beauty of of, of special joy of observing the simplicity of childlike faith, for sure, right? There's something special about newness of faith. In fact, Jesus said, that is how you are to come to him for salvation, like a child. We all must trust him, like a child that is prone to trust. But a baby who grows up physically but stays like a baby, that is a terrible and horribly disappointing observation to make. There is nothing cute about a man who acts like a baby. It's pretty off-putting. It's pretty disgusting if you really think about it. And that reminds us of another one of Paul's references to childlike thinking, which is where we were recently in chapter 13. You can flip over to chapter 13, verse 11. Paul speaks of the normative way of life. When I was a child... I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child, but when I became a man, I did what? I did away with childish things. And talking about things that are temporary as immature versus things that are permanent and mature, Paul pointed to the normal order of things that when you grow up and when you become a mature man, childish talk Childish thinking and reasoning are normally to be done away with. Mature adulthood should mean that immature thinking is a thing of the past. Yet Paul considered it appropriate at this point to command the Corinthian fellowship to not be children in their thinking. It may, as the NIV brings out, have the idea of stop thinking like children. In either way, whether it's don't go there or stop being there, it isn't exactly flattering to the Corinthian body, is it? Sometimes the truth is that way with us. It isn't comfortable and it isn't complimentary of us. Paul is setting them up to receive some mature biblical instruction. You need to grow up in your thinking. And we'll get there in a minute. There is, however, an appropriate sense of Christian immaturity, and that is in terms of evil. We are to be babies in terms of our connections to evil. We should be appropriately unfamiliar with sin. We should be wisely distant from the adulteress's house. We should be blissfully ignorant in terms of our of our intimate knowledge of what wicked people do in secret. Paul refers to things in Ephesians 5:11 that are disgraceful even to speak of the things that are done by those who participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness. In terms of our familiarity with evil, we should be as innocent as a baby who knows far more about the closeness of his mother than he does about all the evil that is in the world. This is not simply a call to be naive. It is a call to be separate. It is a a call to be not like the world, which is intimately familiar with evil. In that sense, you should feel the closeness of your family and a distance from the world. I think there is a sense of disappointment with the Corinthians. That they are 
sophisticated in sin, but they are children in terms of Christian maturity. That is the inverse of what we are after, isn't it? He says, but in your thinking, be mature. You need to be able to handle the Scripture so well that you are able to understand and make connections like the Apostle Paul is about to make. Paul is about to get very mature in his instruction and teaching. Paul is going to make a connection that would not necessarily be obvious to an immature believer, one who is only barely familiar with the Scripture. Look at verse 21. He says, In the law it is written, By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers I will speak to this people. Even so, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but it caught my attention. Paul says, in the law. And wouldn't you then expect to have a quotation from the Pentateuch, which are the first five books of the Old Testament and often referred to as the law. But here, the law is followed by a quote from the book of the prophet Isaiah. And this highlights one of my perspectives that has been helpful, and that is and that is that the entire Bible may be referred to as God's law. There are commands, like here in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, that are applicable to New Testament believers who are, supposed, who are supposedly not under the law, but under grace. That's what modern evangelicalism is most proud of, that we're not under law, we're under grace. We have a whole generation of antinomians, those who are against the law, without the law, or lawless in their view of Christian living. But God's whole counsel may be seen in terms of God's standard of right and wrong, truth, wisdom, and justice. And this is not the only place that does this. In the Psalms and in Romans, the law is spoken of in terms of the entirety of written Scripture. That observation is free. There is no extra charge for that this morning. But Paul says that the law, written in the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, verse 11, talks about this, and he uses part of a verse, verse uh, verse 12. He says, By men of strange tongues and by the lips of strangers, I will speak to this people, and even so they will not listen to me. Part of that is verse 11 of chapter 28 of Isaiah, and part of that is chapter 12 of verse, tw- of chapter t- verse 12 of chapter 28 of Isaiah. Now this is where it gets interesting. And this is where maturity in the Scripture is valuable. At Isaiah 28, the context is that the year is approximately 705 B.C. in the divided kingdom of Israel in the south. Okay, we are in Judah. We are in the south portion of the divided kingdom of Israel. Remember, Israel is what the northern tribes were called. Southern tribes called Judah. And 15 years earlier, the northern kingdom had been taken and destroyed by the Assyrians as a judgment of God upon them for their apostasy and for their unbelief. God judged the northern tribes. They were judged severely for their rebellion against God. Now the prophet is addressing the leaders of the southern kingdom during the reign of Hezekiah. And they too have been a disobedient people. And Isaiah warns them that judgment is going to come upon them. The judgment that came upon Israel will also come upon them. And they were very familiar with what the brutality and the bloodshed that was experienced by the northern tribes, what that was like. Isaiah is warning them, judgment is going to come upon you for the same reasons as it did upon the northern kingdom. And you know what it was like for them. Brutality, bloodshed, and captivity. Imagine the reputation of the violent and brutal Taliban in Afghanistan today. 
known for being butchers and especially abusive to women and children. Isaiah is telling Judah that if their rebellion against God will result, that their rebellion against God will result in the Taliban-like judgment that will come upon them. Brutal people will come against you and you'll be judged. That's the theme of the message that Isaiah has for the leaders of Judah represented by the name Ephraim. So Isaiah comes to the leaders. He comes to the prophets and the priests. And in verse 1 of chapter 28 he says, Woe to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley of those who are overcome with wine. Verse 3 of 28. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot. Verses 7 and 8. And these also reel with wine and stagger from strong drink. The priest and the prophet reel with strong drink. They are confused by wine. They stagger from strong drink. They reel while having visions. They totter when rendering judgment. For all the tables are full of filthy vomit without a single clean place. So here comes the prophet Isaiah. He comes to the leaders, the crown as it were, of the people of Judah. And he comes before them and he says, you guys are full of drunkenness. There is filthy vomit everywhere. He comes to leadership and they are asleep at the wheel. They are partying. They are enjoying the fruits of their prosperity to the point of excess. The prophet comes and they are drunk and there is vomit everywhere. They have no discernment. They are staggering about and they are surrounded by the stench of vomit and they are satisfied in themselves. They think they're just fine. They think they're the the leaders that God has raised up. But the leaders are unfaithful hypocrites and they satisfy themselves with the vices of excess and drunkenness. And listen to the response of these drunk priests and prophets. What do you think they will say? Listen, what do you think that these guys would respond to Isaiah's message? To Isaiah's indictment of them? How would drunk partygoers respond to the preacher today who shows up at their party and tells them that they are foolish, that they are wicked, and they are coming under the judgment of God? What do you think drunk partygoers would tell the preacher? They would do exactly what these men did. They mocked Isaiah. And in verses 9 through 10, to whom would he teach knowledge? And to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk? Those just taken from the breast? For he says, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. They're saying, what kind of a teacher is this guy? He is unsophisticated. His message is always the same. He speaks as if he's talking to little babies. He's a baby teacher. He's a nursery worker. Like someone who is just giving the basics to little children who have just been weaned off their mother's breast. This guy is unsophisticated. He's not cool at all. He has a bad philosophy of ministry. He won't drink with us. He's a baby teacher. Order on order, line on line, a little here, a little there. And they make fun of him and they dismiss his words of judgment. Then in verse 11, this is the part that Paul quotes. Isaiah responds to them. He goes back to them and he says, 
God will speak to you, but that speaking will be in judgment. And when you hear the Babel of the Babylonians, when you hear the Babel of stammering lips of a foreign tongue, that is the sign that judgment has come. You think Isaiah is talking baby talk? You are going to be like babies when you can't understand what the people around you are saying as they come to destroy, brutalize, and take you away into captivity. The script is going to be flipped upon the leaders of Judah. You won't heed the simple words of judgment from the prophet, so the Lord will bring judgment upon you that you will not understand what is being said. And when you can't understand what is being said, know that God's judgment has fallen. Isn't the Lord's timing amazing? And we must, not, we must be careful. We read this recently in 2 Peter. We must not consider the Lord to be slow concerning His promises. It was 119 years later, but it came. 119 years passed of God's patience with them and opportunity for them to repent and to turn to the Lord. But that fulfillment of prophecy came about. And isn't that amazing that these drunkards appeared to win? They appeared to have the advantage over Isaiah. Because it was 119 years later when this prophecy was fulfilled. They went on in their drunken ways and it was their great-grandchildren that experienced God's judgment. Not only did Isaiah declare such a sign of judgment, but so did Moses in Deuteronomy 28 and Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 5. Both declared that a sign of judgment was coming, and that sign would be when you hear strange languages. When you can't understand what people are saying, you're being judged. Now fast forward to the first century A.D. We need to recognize what the Apostle Paul is saying. He says you need to grow up in your thinking. You need to be mature. This whole tongues thing is not something for fun. This is not about you. Yes, it is amazing that the Spirit has proliferated languages among the early church. Paul saying, I'm glad I actually get to do that even more than you all. But the presence of the gift of languages is not for kicks and giggles. It is a sign of judgment. This is big boy theology you are participating in. Not the little child excitement and experience. Tongues are not for edification. They are a sign. They are a marker. They are an indicator that judgment from God is coming. And that judgment, when did it come? That judgment came upon the nation of Israel in 70 AD. Paul is looking back to Isaiah. And the fact that God would judge Israel, and the sign that the judgment was from God was that they would hear and not understand the Babel of the Babylonians. And upon hearing the judgment, they will not hear the Lord. Having eyes that cannot see and ears that cannot hear. And so God will judge Judah for her rebellion and unbelief. Listen, how much more will God judge Israel when they crucified their own Messiah? And so the proliferation of tongues was a sign that God was about to come in judgment. And He did in 70 A.D. when Judaism was destroyed by the Romans. Jesus Himself warned of judgment. Luke 13, 35, Behold, your house is left to you desolate. Luke 20, verse 21, 
When you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then you know that its desolation is near. Judgment upon Israel was no secret, but in their haughty drunkenness, they wouldn't listen. Paul says in verse 22, look at verse 22, so then tongues are for a son. Not to those who believe, but to unbelievers. But prophecy is not to unbelievers, but to those who believe. Unfortunately, the New American Standard says prophecy is a sign, but you notice that it has italics. Prophecy was not a sign, because that was not, it, that was not indicated in the original text. That was added as a clarifying point by the translators, but unfortunately it doesn't clarify properly. Tongues were for the evidence of judgment for Israel and for unbelievers who reject Christ. Look at verse 23. Therefore, if the whole church assembles together and all speak in tongues, and ungifted men or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are mad? Listen, if when you are assembled, and an unbeliever or someone who is unfamiliar with the gift of tongues comes in, notice that this is a real possibility, but it is not the target. There is a possibility that an unbeliever, an outsider, would come into the gathering. Even though tongues are assigned to the unbeliever, the assembly is not the place where tongues are to be used. Paul says that if you come together, and everyone is speaking in tongues, it will appear to be madness. And you can imagine, right? Imagine one person speaking Mandarin Chinese, another person speaking Spanish, another person speaking Russian, another person speaking fill in the blank, a cacophony of foreign languages. It would be a madhouse. It would be a cacophony of unintelligible gibberish and that would not be profitable for an unbeliever. He's going to think you're crazy. We're just closing the door, guys. We'll get this taken care of. You will appear to be out of your mind, Paul says. So how were tongues to be used then? If they are assigned to unbelievers, especially the Jews, then what were they for? What were tongues for then? I argue that tongues were to be used outside of church primarily in public witnessing and evangelism. Now when we read, Paul gives the permission to use tongues, but it's going to be regulated very carefully. But the primary purpose of tongues was as a witness in evangelism, seeking to communicate the gospel in a language that would be strange to most, but familiar to a few. It would be an indictment against the Jews that the gospel was being spoken in a Gentile language. We talked about this before, right? We've talked about this several times. That it was a remarkable sign of judgment to the Jews that the gospel of the Jewish Messiah would be put into the tongue of Gentile languages. But in the assembly, the primary purpose of the gathering was not evangelism. This is instructive for our philosophy of ministry. That is not the primary purpose of that. Because the idea is, if an outsider, if an unbeliever comes into your assembly, that would be an exceptional circumstance, but a possible one. What has Paul been saying this whole time about the purpose of our gathering? It's for edification. It's for building each other up. It's for the building up of the body into maturity as we worship God. But that edifying work could then result in salvation of a lost person when he comes into an assembly where there is order and where he can understand what is being said. Speaking of in tongues in the assembly was not edifying to anybody without an interpreter. And the church in Corinth had the proliferation of tongues and they wanted to show off. They wanted to, to use their gifting when they got together. They were proud of themselves. And Paul is saying, you've misunderstood. You are in deeper theological water than you realize. 
Look at verses 24 to 26. But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or an ungifted man enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed. And so he will fall on his face and worship God, declaring that God is certainly among you. What is the outcome then, brethren? When you assemble, each one has a psalm, has a teaching, has a revelation, has a tongue, has an interpretation. Has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. If the emphasis in the church is on prophecy which is the clear and understandable speaking of God's Word that could not be naturally known. We've talked about this multiple times, just a quick review. Prophecy is not just preaching. In the first century, the gift of prophecy was the ability to speak God's message, a word from God that could not have been known naturally. Some of that was actually revealing what was done already in the past, some would be short-term future uh, prophecies in terms of proclaiming what was going to take place in the future. But preaching, of course, is part of prophecy. And so today the preacher does something that is somewhat prophetic in terms of speaking God's word to the people. There's a prophetic element to the preached word. And so, he says, prophecy, if prophecy happens and an unbeliever comes in, an ungifted man enters, he is able to be convicted by all. And notice that Paul is being rather hyperbolic in his affirmation of the superiority of prophecy. He says, if all prophesied, as opposed to all speaking in tongues. Now, we know that in the church, not all prophesied and not all spoke in tongues. He's providing a lesson. He's speaking to them in, in a way that they would understand. So if, if you were all speaking in prophecy, then an unbeliever would have things exposed to him. You'd be able to actually communicate. I mean, imagine, just like the, the woman at the well, when Jesus says, uh, yeah, you've had five husbands, and the one you're with now isn't. What did that reveal to her? Oh, sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. He was, what did he do? He revealed something to her that, would not, that there was no way he would have known on his own. That's what Paul is pointing to here. If an unbeliever and an ungifted person walks in and a room full of prophets are able to communicate to him and tell him things that they would not be able to know on, them, on their own, but they could communicate in a way that he understood, he would go, oh, wait a minute here. I perceive there are prophets among you. He's saying, I perceive that God is certainly among you. That would be the conclusion if prophecy is primary instead of tongues. <clears throat> this is an example, but not the actual situation. The point is, is that prophecy is superior because it can bring understanding, it can bring conviction, and it points to God's message that is able to even save. So he's saying prophecy should be preferred when you gather, not, not tongues, because tongues is for a different purpose. Paul is driving home that the church is the place where God's word is to be spoken for the sake of pointing the congregation to him. We point the congregation to the knowledge that God is among you. Unbelievers are welcome to join us for church. Please, invite an unbeliever to church. But this is not the primary place for evangelism, and what happens here is designed for the saints. Paul indicates that it would be an exceptional circumstance for that an unbeliever would come to church, but it wouldn't be out of the question. We do not design the church for the world. Our philosophy of ministry is designed for the exaltation and glorification of our great God and Savior and the edification of His body. Paul says that prophecy is superior to tongues in the assembly 
Because the gifted one speaks God's timely message that is able to bring conviction to the heart. Paul certainly gives a sense of what that message is powerful to do, right? Today, we do not have the gift of prophecy, but we do have the complete canon of God's Word. God, God's closed Scripture, His closed canon, is the Word now that we preach. We preach, as Peter called it, the prophetic Word. We come with the message of God, we give it to the saints that we might be built up and caused to be more mature as the Spirit takes the Word and applies it to our hearts and minds. This is not the place for showing off. This is not a place for the pursuit of an ecstatic experience. This is the place where we reasonably and understandably pursue the edification of the body. And if an unbeliever joins us, may God's word be faithfully handled and may the saints communicate the gospel with boldness. The gathering of the church, as Paul said in verse 26, is for the edification of the saints. And we welcome unbelievers into our culture of worship. But this is our culture. What happens here belongs to the saints. And we offer it to the Lord. But we do not change, we do not alter what happens here that we might be pleasing to whoever comes in or be pleasing to people who aren't here. Our goal is to be pleasing to God and edifying to His people. This right here today is family time. And just like in your home, outsiders are welcome. We welcome visitors, we welcome people who have never been here before. But we do not tailor our home for the outsiders. Who is your home tailored for? Your home is built for you and your family. And that's our aim in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Your home is for your people. And outsiders that come in are welcome and are, are, are accepted and are offered the blessing of coming into our home. So may we be careful, brothers and sisters, as we consider our church and our philosophy of ministry, may we be careful to consider what the Apostle Paul declared in Colossians 1 verse 28, that our goal is that we might proclaim Him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. Our goal is not to be pleasing to men. Our goal is not to be attractive to the world. Our goal is that we proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ that as many people as possible may be presented to Him complete in our Savior. Would you pray with me? Our Father, we thank You for this wonderful passage of Scripture and the time and the thoughtfulness and the maturity of the Apostle Paul in communicating this deep, complex truth that links back to the prophet Isaiah, that links back to the idea of judgment. Lord, our world has very little thought of coming judgment. Our world thinks that Jesus is a plaything, that Jesus is safe. That Jesus is simply there to give me what I want. That Jesus is just a friend. Lord, you are a friend to those who have been saved first from wrath and judgment. Because you are a holy God, you will judge all sin. You will judge all sin whether by accounting it to Christ on our behalf, or whether you judge the sinner individually, personally, for their own sin. God, let us make sure that we are those who know who you are. 
according to your revelation. Help us to align ourselves and our thinking with your purposes. I want to pray for those in, caught in charismatic teaching and doctrine that they might come to understand its original purpose and why it is gone today. Lord, I pray that we would be faithful witnesses, that we would be those who hold fast to your truth. We pray that we would maintain a philosophy of ministry of the saints gathered that properly understands what you would have us to do to get to, together. We pray that we would have an exalted view of our great God. May our worship be high and lofty, speaking and singing wonderful things of our God. And may your people, may your children, may our family be edified, blessed, built up, encouraged, exhorted, rebuked. May this family time be one of glorious worship. And Lord, should visitors and outsiders be present with us, we pray that they would have a sense that God is surely among this people. A sense because we uphold the word of the Lord. A sense because we have love for one another. That we desire to declare and know the truth. Or we pray that you would visit salvation upon many today. Pray that you would, as the Apostle John said, convict us of our sin, that we would confess and acknowledge that we do have sin, that we would not be liars and say that we are without sin. And having sin, understand that there is judgment or there is salvation. And we pray that Jesus would be the Savior of the lost today. Help those today, all of us, to understand that you are a God who brings judgment for sin. You did upon Israel in 70 AD, and you will come again, and your second coming will be one of judgment and one of salvation for only those who are in Christ Jesus. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us as we Continue to fellowship and to rest on this Lord's Day. May you be pleased with us, and may we be prepared to live better lives of obedience and worship and thanks to you this week than even this last. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.